Please to John chapter 14. Gospel of John chapter 14. Um, it's Easter. Um, I grew up celebrating Easter, Good Friday, and all those things, and, uh, and I believed the story, I believed the Easter story that Jesus died and that he rose again, and, that, and we celebrated this feast, and we had holy days of obligation, and, but I never, so historically, I, I sort of, I, I believed in it. I, I, I believed the story, but I didn't know it. Okay, and so we have these arguments: Did Jesus really rise from the dead? And there are books written to prove that Jesus rose from the dead, and there are books written to prove that he hasn't. And so, the issue this morning is: With this group of people, we, we, we're celebrating Easter, and it's very hard for me to do a message that is not Easter. <laughs> oh. That has nothing to do with the resurrection, because when I came out of religion, I stopped, I, I stopped doing the feast, because they didn't, they didn't mean anything to me anymore, because we have a vibrant living relationship with the living God every day, and these are just, these are just memorials. They're not, uh, in a sense, it, it's good to remember them, but, but when I'm asked to speak, I, I never think about what day is it, and what should I speak about, and... I remember one time I was asked to speak in this church in Trowbridge in Wiltshire, and I came up and I preached Christ crucified, and I said something that somebody didn't like because I'm probably offending the Catholics or something. But I didn't know it was Pentecost Sunday. I never spoke about Pentecost. Anyway, somebody got saved. A Catholic girl got saved and she got baptized. So in a sense, it's, it's, it's what the Spirit wants to do rather than having that stuff. I can't get away with not talking about Easter today because... Uh, if I look at the meeting, everything else, everything's been going that way. These aren't my notes, these are the notes I just made. I didn't make any notes. Um, <laughs> John chapter 14. Let not your heart be troubled. You believe in God, believe also in me. In my Father's house are many mansions. If it were not so, I would have told you. I go to prepare a place for you. And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again and receive you unto myself, that where I am, that you may be also. And whither I go, you know, and the way you know. Thomas said unto him, Lord, we know not whither thou goest, and how can we know the way? Jesus said unto him, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man cometh unto the Father but by me. If ye had known me, ye should have known my Father also. And from henceforth ye know him, and have seen him. Philip said unto him, Lord, show us the Father, and he sufficeth us. Jesus saith unto him, Have I been so long time with you, yet thou hast not known me, Philip? He that hath seen me hath seen the Father also. How sayest thou then, shows the Father? Believest thou not that I am the Father, and the Father in me? The words that I speak unto you, I speak not of myself, but the Father that dwelleth in me, he doeth the works. Believe me that I am the Father, and the Father in me, else believe me for the very works' sakes. Verily, verily, I say unto you, he that believeth on me, the works that I do, shall he do also, and greater works than these shall he do, because I go unto my Father. And whatsoever you shall ask in my name, that will I do, that the Father may be glorified in the Son. If you shall ask anything in my name, I will do it. That's worth a hallelujah. John chapter 16. These things have I spoken unto you, that you should not be offended. They shall put you out of the synagogues, yea, the time cometh, and whosoever killeth you will think that he doeth God's service. And these things will they do unto you, because they have not known the Father, nor me. But these things have I told you, that when the time shall come, you may remember that I told you of, told you of them. And these things I said not unto you at the beginning, because I was with you. But now I go my way to him that sent me, and none of you ask it me, whither goest thou? But because I have said these things unto you, sorrow hath filled your heart. Nevertheless, I tell you the truth. It is expedient for you that I go away. For if I go not away, the Comforter will not come. But if I depart, I will send him unto you. And when he is come, he will reprove the world of sin 
and of righteousness and of judgment, of sin, because it believed not on me, of righteousness, because I go to my Father and you see me no more, and of judgment, because the Prince of this world has been judged. I have yet many things to say unto you, but you cannot bear them now. How be it when he, the Spirit of truth, is come, he will guide you into all truth, for he shall not speak of himself, whatsoever you shall hear, that shall he speak, and he will show you things to come. He shall glorify me, for he shall receive of mine, and shall show it unto you. John chapter 14, 15, 16 and 17. Jesus is talking to his disciples after the supper, after Judas has gone off to betray him. So Judas isn't one of these that he's talking to. These are his elect. These are the ones that he's going to impart things to. God does not impart things to everybody. He only imparts things to those who will listen. He will call. The call goes out to everyone. But not everyone responds. Not everyone receives. And so he's now talking to his disciples, and to be fair to them, they, don't, they haven't got a clue what he's saying. These are Jewish people who believed in the Messiah. They believed he was the Messiah. He is the Christ, the Son of the living God. He's going to come. He's going to restore Israel. Even after the resurrection, they were saying to him, will you at this time restore the kingdom to Israel? Their mind was very much set. And they had their own standard of righteousness, the righteousness that comes from the law. And here Jesus is saying, he's going to convict the world of sin, and the sin being that they do not believe on him. It's not all the things that we get bent out of shape about, that we protest about this and protest about that. People at work sort of got to know I'm a Christian, they got to know I preach, so they ask me questions on the side and say, so are you a Protestant? I say, I'm not. I'm not protesting about anything. I'm proclaiming the Lord's death. I'm proclaiming the return of the Lord and the day of the vengeance of God because there's a judgment coming. And it's my duty to, to say that there is, you know, we talk about heaven and hell, but we get mystical in sinners' prayers and how can we get safe? The apostolic gospel did not talk about the love of God. The love, he talked about the death, the resurrection, and the return of the Lord coming to judge. And we, people had to flee from the wrath to come. There is a wrath coming. There is a judgment coming. And that is why Jesus died. Because he took that wrath and he took that judgment upon himself. He was, he was the last Adam. And he took upon him everything that was due upon the descendants of Adam. So he made one provision for sin forever. There's no more sacrifice for sin. He became the ultimate sacrifice for sin. And there is no other way to deal with your sin except through the Lamb of God who takes away your sin. And therefore we have passed from judgment to life because the issue of sin has been dealt with once for all. And we have been justified and made righteous by the blood of Jesus, because we have the same righteousness that Jesus had. He didn't make us better people. He didn't improve us. I certainly haven't improved. If anything, I'm deteriorating as I get older. But I have the confidence of being righteous before God, that whatsoever I ask in his name, I will have it. And the fact that I have the Holy Spirit dwelling in me is the witness that Jesus has been raised from the dead. I don't have to go to a book, I don't have to argue with people, because I know. We tend to argue when we don't know. I don't believe in evolution, I believe that God created me. Because I know it's something deep within. I can't argue with somebody who doesn't believe it. I don't have to find out what evolutionists believe. I don't have to find out what other people believe, because I know, and I can only declare what I know. And that is what witnessing is about. It says, you will be witnesses unto me. 
when the Holy Ghost has come upon you. And witnessing isn't telling people about Jesus. Witnessing is witnessing. Because Jesus has, raised, has been raised from the dead and his spirit dwells within me, this is a sign to the unbeliever. Okay? We are a savor of life unto life for those who are being saved and of death unto death for those who are perishing. Okay? There is something that God has done that we cannot fathom out. And those who will be saved will be saved and those who will be judged will be judged. There's not a whole lot we can do about it except proclaim the gospel. And we are living in the days where the return of the Lord is more imminent than it was when I got saved 38 years ago. And it's not because of signs. One of the problems about reading signs is that you get the church goes weird. 1948, Israel was back in the land. How many reasons why Jesus has to come in 1988? 40 years in the land, how many books were written? And then we had the year 2000, why Jesus must come, you know, because, and how many Christians got it? And so we can do all this stuff and stop looking at history and looking at whatever is going on. It is not for you to know the times or the seasons that God has set in his authority. What did he say? He said, be ready. And the spirit within me bears witness that I'm ready, not because I'm a good person, but I'm looking forward to the blessed hope and the appearing of our Lord Jesus Christ. This is the promise to those who said, I am coming for you and I will take you to where I am. I will receive you unto myself. He's not saying this to people who are outside of Christ. He's now, these people that have come into Christ, they're no longer Jew or Gentile. This is a new dispensation altogether. There is a judgment that's coming, and it's coming to the Jew first, and also to the Gentile. The wrath of God is going to be poured out upon all those who do not believe. To the Jew first, and also to the Gentile. It's called the time of Jacob's troubles, where there's going to be a time they're going to go through stuff they've never been through. And that's why we pray for them. Because we love them. And God has put a love in our hearts for them. I don't know why, I'd never met any Jewish people when I got saved. But then I got involved in Jewish ministry. But, it, but that's, that's a different story. But the, the reality is that there is a judgment that's coming. And we have passed from judgment to life not because we deserve it. And the very fact that we've been made partakers of the divine nature should humble us. Why me? What have I got to offer? Nothing. But we have Christ in us, the hope of glory. And people have to see Christ. They don't have to see what a good Christian you are at work. They don't have to see all these things. You don't have to tell them. Sometimes we are so noisy with our testimony. <laughs> I, I've heard... Before, I remember what it was like before I was saved. I hadn't met Christians that had any joy. They were good people. Lovely people. But they didn't like each other because one went to this place and one went to that place. And I was much happier in the pub. I was much happier doing my things. Were they happy going to church? I was happy. They weren't. There was nothing in them that provoked me to jealousy. To be fair to them, I was dead in my trespasses and sins, and the God of this world had blundered my eyes anyway, so it's not necessarily their fault. But my point is I didn't see it. And when I got saved... I wanted to provoke people to jealousy. I wanted people to see that there was something that they would want. So I didn't talk about Jesus, I never witnessed. But people used to come and knock on the door and say, can you pray for me, can I come to your church? I didn't know who they were. But this is the whole thing about the Holy Spirit. He does things that we cannot do. I've never felt under pressure to witness. I never cared that people were going to hell. I actually don't. God cares. There's no use pretending we care because we wouldn't be sitting here listening to me. (laughs) We have this thing where we, 
this sent we have a sentiment about it. But the issue is not that people are going to hear. The issue is that Jesus is coming back and he's setting a new order. All things will pass away and all things will become new. We have already received the, the, the down payment on that. Hasn't your life changed since Jesus came into your life? Have the, your, your values, how did that happen? It happened because there was another life force which was, more, which was greater than you. That was directing you away from your lust, directing you away from the things that you would rather do. And every time you think, I must be a better Christian, I must try harder, you got worse. <laughs> the moment you go to the law, you fall. That's what Romans 7 is all about. When I would do good, that evil is present in me. But when you're dealing, when, you, when you're moving with the Spirit of God and letting Him do the work, you're not conscious of the good that you do. If you're conscious of the good that you do, then you're probably not doing that good. <laughs> but, but the reality is that this thing is real. It's not something we have to argue. It is something that God has set in eternity. And the fulfillment of that is yet to come. But we have the earnest, the deposit, and our spirit groans within us, waiting for the redemption of our waiting for the redemption of our bodies, because this body is not yet redeemed. Okay? But we can draw on our salvation. We can draw from the wells of salvation, and we can receive things. We can receive healing. We can receive provision. We can receive a whole lot of things until we die. Because <laughs> that's the only thing we're sure of. If Jesus hasn't come back, is that we're going to die. But the other thing that we're sure of is that we're ready because he has made us ready. Not as ready as I would like to be. I don't know what that means. Somebody asked John Wesley, you know, I think, what would you do if you knew that Jesus was coming back tomorrow? He said, well, I'll go and visit Mr. So-and-so and I'll go and do this. He would do exactly the same things that he was doing. It's no use us pretending that we would change how we live if we knew Jesus was coming tomorrow. We wouldn't. We are set in our ways. We have the sentiment of Jesus coming back tomorrow. And the reason for that is that we're not fully convinced of the finished work. We're not fully convinced of the power of the Holy Spirit that is able to do more than my effort. I have to do my bit. No, your bit gets in the way. Yeah? How many times have you found that? I used to get anxious about everything. I used to pray so hard about things as if my prayer would get me there. I'd be fretting all the time because I didn't really believe. I mean, I believed the doctrine and I was as saved then as I am now, but I hadn't grown in the things of God. I hadn't, I hadn't learned to let go. I hadn't learned that I wasn't the center of my walk. Discipleship is a call to follow Jesus, and it's an individual call. It's not the church you go to. And every disciple knows the Lord, and he follows the Lord wherever he goes. And that's how, that's how we receive things. We don't receive things by reading books. Have you met people that read books, and they tell you, what a wonderful book this is? And then I read it, and I think, no, I don't actually like that. Because it doesn't register with me. It's probably great for them, but we're not all the same. God has got a different calling for each one of us. Not all of us are going to be standing here preaching. Not all of us are going to be doing flowers. Not all of us are going to be doing community. Not all of us are going to be leading meetings. It, it isn't about that. It isn't what you do. It's about what you allow God to do based on the resurrection power in your life. Every one of us has resurrection power. And don't let the devil tell you that you haven't. Don't let him tell you that you're less than somebody else. Don't start aspiring to something that you're not. Because this is the whole thing, when we, when we talk about the resurrection, it is not a, a one-off, it happened 2,000 years ago. It's a present, continuous, that resurrection power is at work within me now. Amen. It's at work within you now. It's at work within you when you go to work. So it's always there, but we're not conscious of it because the devil makes us look at what's happening around us. 
He looks at everything that's wrong. Pray about this, pray about that, pray about this. And so we become this superstitious people, as if God has given us nothing. We should be a people that are confident. Greater is he that is in me than he that is in the world. I've said this before. When I first realized that, I lost my fear of the devil. I was always devil conscious. Oh, look what the devil's doing. Well, he's got his job. God has given him a job to do, and he's doing it. <laughs> That's what he's doing. So do, you, so do you want to start doing God's job for the devil? I mean, I don't know. What are we trying to do? We're taking our focus away. Instead of looking unto Jesus, the author and the finisher of our faith, who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross, he despised the shame. So we cannot take up our cross daily and follow him unless we do it in the power of the Holy Spirit. Jesus himself did that in the power of the Holy Spirit, who through the eternal spirit offered up himself. And through the blood of the everlasting covenant, he raised him from the dead. So there's the work of the Holy Spirit that was going on in Jesus from the time that he got baptized in the River Jordan. And if he needed that, I needed more. He was a man without, he was born without sin. He never had to deal with the issues of sin like we do. His temptations were of another kind. He had the temptations, and he was tempted in all points like as we were, yet without sin. But if you look at the temptations of Jesus, it was always to do, you know, if you're the son of God, turn these stones into bread. Look after yourself. If you're the son of God, fall down and worship me. I'll give you all the kingdoms of this world. Well, he came. Amen. All the kingdoms of this world will become the kingdoms of our Christ and his God. Amen. But he did it God's way. He didn't do it the devil's way. Yeah? So the temptations of Jesus were different from our temptations. And when you learn to walk in the Spirit, you realize yeah, your temptations are different. It's not so much because, you know, generally believes that are not given to sin. But the temptations of another, it's about self fulfillment, self aggrandizement. I want to be like God. Where did that come from? And there are. Uh, you know, I, I talk to people because they ring me up and they ask me all these questions, and most people have not been grounded in, in, in gospel doctrine, the gospel of free grace. So they always get stuck. So when they struggle with something, they look at the thing they're struggling with and they say, how do I deal with this? How do I deal with this? And I always take them back to the gospel roots. I always get them to remember who they are in Christ and, and how... But the thing that you look at becomes bigger. If you look at Jesus, that becomes bigger. If you look at your sin, it gets bigger. That's why it says in Hebrews, lay aside the sin that so easily besets you. Yeah. Now, it's not saying pretend it's not there. He's saying lay it aside. Don't give it weight. Looking unto Jesus, the author and the finisher of your faith. Okay? Jesus can deal with that thing. Your willpower can't. How many of you tried to deal with sin with willpower and have succeeded? You can get up here and preach because I've never done it. God has given us power. Behold what manner of love the Father has bestowed upon us that we should be called sons of God. And this is what the resurrection is all about. After the resurrection, he ascended. He ascended on high and he gave gifts to men. And that was the vindication, as, as the blood was presented, so everything that the enemy has done has been undone. Okay? When he hung on that cross, he said, it is finished. Paid in full. Oh yes, but I must do my bit. Yeah. Surrender. <laughs> Yield. Believe. That's what you've got to do. And, and sometimes we get this even with, with, with preachers trying to put another burden on you, trying to make you feel bad about the fact that you're not where you should be. Well, I feel bad enough. I don't need you to make me feel bad. 
I don't need a preacher to whip me up and say, you know, I should be doing more stuff. I know I should. But if I'm looking unto Jesus, who says, come unto me, all ye who labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you another burden. Sorry. And I will give you rest. It's religion that gives you the burden. I'm done with religion. It's the world that gives you a burden. I'm done with the world. And it's my ego that gives me the burden. Not quite done with that. <laughs> but that's where the process is. It gets in the way. It gets in the way of wanting to succeed, wanting, wanting to look spiritual, wanting to look successful. And we have this prosperity doctrine that feeds you these principles. And the principles sound fine, but it's another gospel. It's another Jesus. And so you can learn spiritual principles and you can apply them. But what you find is that it leaves you hollow. It leaves you shallow. What you find is that you're thinking about yourself all the time. You're thinking about your rights all the time. Instead of Jesus. And obviously, between now and when Jesus comes, we're going to fail, we're going to mess up. It won't make any difference to him because he's dealt with it. If we fail, if we mess up, it only affects us and maybe those around us. It doesn't affect God one little bit. You know, he loves you. Unto him who loved us and washed us in his own blood. He didn't wash us and then love us. He loved us and then washed us in his own blood. And if you're more blood conscious, then you will deal with sin more easily. If you're self-conscious, you will just multiply your sin. You will multiply your self-defense. So when we talk about Easter, there's nothing to do with Easter, is it? It's not something historic that we celebrate once a year. It's the resurrection power that Jesus has imparted to everyone who believes. Amen? God bless you.